day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Improve Your Crawl Knowledge webinar. I would like to introduce Russell Ingleton and Scott Belfer. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating and joining us this evening. Uh, just before we get started, just want to go through a couple of technical things for you. Uh, you might find it a little bit easier to adjust your webinar. I'll leave it up to you if you want to. You might want to put the video down into the right-hand side. And to do that, just hover your mouse over top of the little icon that I'm showing on the screen right now. And when you hover, it will automatically pop open a little extra box there. You might want to pick the middle one that says side-by-side -side view, and that'll move you down or move me down into the right-hand side and provide a little extra space to the viewing. Um, during today's session, at any time, you can actually submit a question. Simply do that. Just click on the Q&A button, and at the bottom of the screen, that's where it's arranged. You can enter your question in there. Leave it set to all panelists, and then set, hit the Send button. And that way, during this webinar, again, we'll be able to reply to any questions that you may actually have. So some quick little introductions. Uh, my name is Russell Ingleton. I'm one of the uh, old guys with Kroll. I've been doing this for, hang on, what time is it? Oh, 30 years or so now. So uh, they've asked me to uh, present in this evening's uh, seminar. Um, and uh, also my co-presenter tonight is Mr. Scott Belfer. Scott, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Russell. Uh, my name is Scott Belfer. I am a licensed pharmacist in the province of Ontario, and I still practice part-time to keep my A status license. I've been with the Coral slash Telus team now for five and a half years, and I've actually been in the product management role. Uh, both Russell and myself do this, and we work with people like yourself to try and make Coral a better product. Back to you. Thank you very much, Scott. And also assisting us this evening in the background are Aaron and Avnish. They're part of our learning specialist team, and they'll be actually feel, fielding those answers, uh, answers to any of those questions that you may be submitting during the presentation. Now, they'll try to get to all of those answers during the presentation, but if we do get quite a few, we may have to actually respond to you later, and we do promise to get back to everybody within a week's time. Um, also, please note that at the end of this presentation, we'll also be giving the opportunity where we'll open up the phone lines and you can actually ask us any questions that maybe we haven't answered yet. So, I've already done the introductions. Um, tonight's agenda was difficult to put together because, to be honest with you, we had quite the overwhelming response to both the registrations for this evening and to the original survey that we actually sent out to try to prepare for this tight session. Um, we tried to take a look at all of those questions submitted, and inside of one hour, we had to try to satisfy as many people as we could. So, we looked for some of the common denominators in those questions and basically came up with this particular list for our agenda. Now we know there's a lot of you out there that will certainly be quite familiar with some of the things that we're going to be talking to about tonight. We hope, however, by the end of this evening that at least someone takes at least something away from part of this presentation. So uh, with that, these are sort of the options that we've tried to actually come up. Now I should mention during that survey that we got back for determining what we were going to have a talk to about tonight, there was a lot of questions posed as well that really does need follow-up, but the problem was the survey was quite anonymous, so we haven't got back to you. It's not because we're ignoring you, it's because we don't know who you were. So uh, if we haven't answered your question after this evening, uh, there will actually be another survey, but we certainly will encourage you uh, to uh, contact our help desk for any additional questions that you may have. So tonight, having said that, we're going to try to put together, I think, six or seven items that were some of the common theme from the original survey we sent out. So actually, Scott's going to uh, start off initially by talking about paperless workflow. And again, probably those in Ontario are quite familiar with that process or any other stores that have already implemented that. Uh, I'll be talking to you a little bit about how you can leverage the Kroll nursing home functionality specifically to do batch filling just for your retail patients. 
And again, if you're already using our nursing home and certainly already have some uh, long-term care facilities, you may already be familiar with that. But I'm also going to show you how you can actually schedule a batch to automatically run as well. Scott then will be taking over again and talking about leveraging some of the calendar functions in Kroll. He'll also talk to you about how you can optimize your inventory reconciliations. And then it'll be back to me. I'm going to talk about faxing directly from the Kroll system. And then I'm going to finish off with a tips and tricks round at the very end. So with that said, what I'll do is I'm going to go now and uh, I'm going to hand this over to Scott and uh, let Scott talk to you about paperless workflow. Scott. Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, just a bit of a word of caution. We use the word paperless kind of a little loosely here because I think we all know that a pharmacy cannot be completely paperless because we do have documents that we do have to create and hand to patients. But from our workflow perspective, we can try and get as close to paperless as we can, and that's what we're going to try and talk about today. So from a system setup perspective or a utilization perspective, Coral provides two options for paperless or document electronic document storage. We have what's called print and scan, and we have what's called digital signature capture. With the print and scan, um, it's very basic. It's actually Kroll's first foray into the paperless world. You basically continue to print what you need, as you currently do now. You put pen to paper to document anything that you need on, say, the hard copy. But using 2D barcode technology, you scan that document back into the system the system will then translate the information in the barcode and save that document against the appropriate prescription record or patient record. And then once that's done successfully, you no longer have to file that sheet of paper. You can actually go and shred them. So what do I need to do to set this up? Very basic. I need a document scanner to begin with. And I just need a couple of store level configuration options to activate certain barcodes. So from File, Store, Configuration, Labels, Barcodes, you want to be able to put a 2D barcode on your hard copy, which is illustrated on the right-hand side of the slide here. You just check off the hard copy option under 2D barcoding. And you want to put a script image barcode on your vial label by just clicking on the option in the lower left. And the example you see is in the middle of the screen, as you can see it. This layout is our thermal print label set also works with your laser label set as well. The barcode is hard coded or defaulted to print to the fifth position of your warning labels on both of those label sets. So what do I do? Simply you just process each prescription item on the written prescription and you generate a label set as you currently do. You ensure the script image barcode label is affixed to the original prescription for every item noted. So for example, if I have three drugs on one single written prescription, I should have three unique barcodes on that written prescription before I will scan it. You sign the hard copy and add any other information as you normally would, clinical notes, that sort of thing. And what most people do right now is they'll set aside both the hard copy and the original prescription somewhere on the dispensary in an easily accessible area because they're going to scan them a little later. So when you're ready, either at the end of the day or more frequently depending on your volume, you'll take those two stacks of paper, put one stack in your feed tray of your document scanner, and then from the main menu on the start screen, you select Utilities, Patient Document Scan slash Import, hit the start scanning button and then the system pretty much takes over and then you're prompted to complete. You then repeat that for the stack of the original written prescriptions that have that script image barcode label affixed to it. So what the system does when it uses this utility is it will read all the information on the barcode and make sure that those images are linked to the correct and the appropriate prescription record. So what we have here is an example. So if you bring the prescription up after you've scanned, in Modify Mode, and then select the RX Imagers button on the navigation bar to the right. The image, first image that you see will be of the scanned original written prescription. And if you click on the hard copy tab, which is the one on the right, you'll be able to see the image of the signed hard copy. Once those are stored, you don't necessarily have to file them anymore as pieces of paper, because they're stored electronically in your system, so you can shred them. 
Digital signature capture is a little more complex. The original written prescription is scanned into your system either by using the drop-off functionality or by using the script image barcode that we just discussed. You no longer generate a printed hard copy. That hard copy is actual an electronic record saved within the system. Your pharmacist or your licensed technician will sign each prescription using a digital signature capture pad. Any additional notes are recorded as comments or notes linked to the prescription record. To do this, once again, you'll need a document scanner to scan the original written. You will need a compatible digital signature tablet in order to get the electronic signature. With the Kroll Teams Assistant, we can help you activate the digital signature capture configuration options within Kroll, and we will add at least one workflow on-screen verification step. This is needed in order to prompt the user for the signature, and it's, this is the step at which the signature actually gets saved against the re prescription record. This approach is compatible with both your laser label and thermal label environments. However, please be aware if you elect to go down this path and still maintain your laser labels, you will notice a nice big white space in the spot on your, hard on your laser label set where you would normally print the hard copy. Since we no longer print the hard copy, you now have some white space. Digital signatures capture, you process your prescriptions, and as each prescription is displayed on that on-screen verification step that I mentioned, the pharmacist or the technician will be prompted to sign. So using the signature pad, they will literally record their signature like, just like they're printing or putting pen to paper. What you see on the, on the slide below is just a rendering of the signature screen on, layered on top of the verification screen. The digital signature capture is not just for signing of prescriptions like we've just illustrated, which is the, kind of the basic element that we start with. You do have the opportunity to utilize that technology to sign electronic versions of your med reviews, sign electronic versions of your immunization forms. If configured, you can obtain a patient signature on pickup and you can sign off on a patient counseling session to confirm that the pharmacist actually did it. Whenever we entertain or have the discussions with a pharmacy about going the paperless route, the question always comes up, what do I do if I'm audited by a third-party payer, or what do I do if a college inspector comes in and they're looking to look at my information, they're, like, they're trying to look at my hard copies when I don't print them? What we've done is we've created a report called the Electronic Hard Copy Report that you can generate for a specific prescription, a range of prescriptions, prescriptions for a particular schedule, or even prescriptions processed by a specific or to a specific pair. So what we have on screen now are two examples of that same report. On the left is what the report looks like if we elect to go with the print and scan approach to paperless. On the left-hand side is the scanned image of the printed hard copy that you signed, and on the right is the scanned image of the original written prescription. The image on your right is an example of the report generated in an electronic, electronic signature capture environment. On the right-hand side is a rendering of the hard copy as if we did print it. The right-hand side is the image of the original prescription that we've scanned in. And the sections on the bottom outlines the workflow actions and the steps at which the signatures were applied, along with the initials of the person that performed that step and the date and time that that step did occur. Now, before turning it over to Russell to talk about batch filling, just one thing that the Kroll team at TELUS Health always recommends, no matter what option you go with, with paperless, whether it's print and scan or digital signature capture, we always recommend that you employ the off-site backup process. That way, you're, there's a high level of comfort knowing that your data is safe in the event of a catastrophic event at your store where your hardware gets destroyed. So I'm going to turn it over to Russell, who will continue the discussion on batch filling. Thanks very much, Scott. 
So yes, as I said earlier in my introduction, what I want to actually show you here is how you can actually use the nursing home setup that's in your system today uh, and actually use that for your retail patients on just regular weekly batch fills as an example. I'm going to go through and just show you how to add a patient to the nursing home, how you fill in a brand new prescription and how you add existing prescriptions on a patient to a batch. At that point, I'm going to fill the batch manually and then later I'm going to just redo it and show you how you can actually set up the batch to just schedule it so it automatically runs for you so when you walk in in the morning, your prescription is already waiting for you filled. So what I'm actually going to do is just do a quick walkthrough. Now, all of this starts through this nursing home menu option on the main screen. Now, if you don't actually have that on your system, you can actually enable it under the file configuration store general tab. But there's an option there for nursing home batch filling. And once you just turn that on, then you come back out, that'll have this new menu option on there. Now, you'll probably still need our assistance for setting up the nursing home and getting the first thing going at that point. But, uh, but this is part of the regular uh, Kroll installation. So even if you don't see it, you've actually got the feature available to you. So I'm just going to go under my nursing home menu here. I'm just going to go and edit my nursing home list. I've got a bunch in there, but I'm going to go pick up the one I've already set up for tonight's presentation. And I've just called it retail blister pack. So it's not really a nursing home. It's just for my retail patients. I've created four different cycles in this example, and each cycle is a 28-day cycle, and each one is offset by seven days. So I've called this week one, two, three, and four, and so on. So I'm just going to cancel out of this, and now what I'm going to do, now that I've got the home set up and the cycle set up, now we've got to put the patient into my home. So I'm going to go into F3 patient, I'm going to bring my patient up on the screen, and because of an, I've enabled the nursing home function, the patient card will have this extra tab on the lower corner here where it actually says nursing home. So from that tab for the nursing home, I would just choose the nursing home that I've just created, in this case, the retail blister packs. And by default, it's actually going to pick my, uh, uh, I, I could pick from the diff four different cycles. So I can choose for this patient to put this patient into a default cycle. So if I know, for example, I'm just coming up to my week one cycle again, then I'll choose as a default for this patient, I'll put them in the week number one cycle. So I'm just going to go save that on my patient record. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go fill a brand new prescription to show you how that works. Now, really, at the beginning, it's no different. You fill in all the prescription information like you normally do. But the difference becomes once you hit the enter or the lookup key, this other window actually ends up appearing, this our nursing home Rx information screen. So down here, we've got the nursing home cycle and a batch fill automatically tagged. Now, I can override that default cycle so that I have put the patient in should I want to, but typically most of your scripts are going to try to keep the patient in sync and have all the scripts in the same cycle. And by default, it's also turned on the batch fill flag. But if this was a prescription for an acute condition or a PRN med, I may not actually want to have that in the batch fill. In that example, I would just un check the batch fill flag and it won't actually be part of my batch fill at all. Down on the lower part of the screen, I have my different unit dosing where I can just indicate the number of units for the four different pass times and then just click on the OK button in the upper corner. Now, in this particular case, the system has recognized that my upcoming weekly number one cycle is only five days away. I filled in a 28-day supply on my prescription screen, the computer suggesting or asking whether or not I might want to adjust that to bring this very first fill in sync with that upcoming cycle. So in this case, I can either accept that or just uh, uh, decline it and stay with the original amounts I keyed in there. If I do accept the proposed amount, the lower day supply, don't worry. When you do actually run this the first time in the batch, it will automatically adjust the day supply and the quantity to match the total number of days in that particular cycle. Back at the fill screen, then I would just hit F12 and I would complete my prescription just like I normally would at that point. 
Now, obviously, an existing patient will have existing prescriptions, and you may want to go through their profile and decide which of these prescriptions should be part of that same batch fill cycle that you've just created. So what you do is you would just tag any of the appropriate prescriptions, bring up the modify button, and then really what happens is just go down to the lower part where it says Alt-N, or you can either hit Alt-N or just click on that area, and it brings up that same form that we saw earlier. So just like before, you'll indicate the cycle, whether this is a batch fill script, ensure the unit dose tag is turned on, enter your unit dosing information, hit OK to save it, F12 to save the changes, and then repeat that for each of the prescriptions that you've tagged. Now, what you may also want to do is under the patient profile with the various columns, you can actually configure or add another column. And in this example, I've created a B batch column, and that basically gives me at a glance whether or not any of these prescriptions have been uh, are now tagged for an actual batch fill cycle. So let's go and actually start filling a batch in this case. So I'm going to be back at my start screen, and I'm going to go into nursing home. I'm going to select batch fill, select my home, and select which cycle it is that I actually want to start the, the uh, batch fill for. So it comes up to my batch list. I'm going to create a brand new batch for the first time. And the system will actually go through now all of the patients and take a look at every prescription that has been designated in this example for week one and put them into this sort of this pre-edit screen at this point. Now, I can actually create this batch a day or two before I'm actually going to fill it. I can actually go in here, start working on the prescriptions, and if, for example, I've got some scripts that need read repeats or something, I can save this batch if I want to, get out, and then come back into it later, and it'll put me right back to where I was before I actually start processing it. So in this example here, I've got several prescriptions, but one of them actually needs some repeats on it. So I'll just select that option tab at the top. I'm going to choose the option to add repeats to any scripts that need it. And that'll clear that, that particular prescription. So now all of my prescriptions are clear and ready to go. So at this point, I'm now going to go and click on the main process batch button. And this brings up a form now where I can decide which order do I want to fill those prescriptions in. What is the fill date going to be assigned to these prescriptions? Because I could post date it. And then at the bottom of the screen, I can decide if I want to initiate the adjudication as long as I'm not post-dating and whether or not I want to print the labels right now. I can actually turn that off, defer the printing of labels, come back later and just print the labels when I'm ready. So I'm just going to click on the process batch button. The system will actually start filling the prescriptions. And in this case, all of my prescriptions now have been completed. They've all got a status of adjudicated, i.e. that they're done. And this is where if I wanted to, I could come back later and now just print the labels all in one mass if I want to and close off this batch. It takes me back to this form. I'll close this form off and I'm back to the start screen. Simple as that. Now, what I may want to do, that shows you how I actually go through and, and run a batch interactively where I can actually go through, edit prescriptions, uh, and then actually decide when I want to process them. So I'm just going to repeat that now, but I'm going to show you how I can actually set that batch up and have it automatically scheduled. Now, if you're already using this for any of your LTC facilities, or even if you are using it for retail patients and you've already got the batching down, all that you may need to do if you want to consider is actually set these up to actually schedule at a certain time. So to do that, I'm just going to go back into my nursing home. I'm going to go and edit my nursing home again for retail blister packs. There's all my different cycles. Now, for each one of those cycles, what I actually do is I'm going to go in and edit them. And you can see here I've got a date on here saying next run date. And I will use that in conjunction with these options at the bottom here where I can put a checkbox beside the automatically fill batch in background. And the very next field says, and what time do you want to run it? So in other words, at 6 a.m. on October 15th, this batch is just automatically going to kick in and start running. 
you'll see that third from last option there says fill prescriptions as user. I obviously have to assign a user to this as who it's going to be filled under because the idea is this person isn't going to have to come into the pharmacy at 6 a.m. It's just going to start filling. And then I can decide who am I going to send the notification to that the batch is now complete. So I can set up a local mail distribution list and say send the success or failure messages to that particular mail distribution list to let them know a batch is now done. So I'm just going to do that. And you would have to repeat that for each of, in this example, my four cycles as to what time I wanted to run them at and who I was going to run them under. So now, October 15th comes in, I walk in in the morning, it's now 9 a.m., and in my case, I see that I've got a mail message waiting for me. So I'll just go into my mail, and sure enough, here's the message letting me know that my week one cycle that was started October 15th, it was filled in the background automatically, Ah, but it does need some review. So I'll get out of my mail system. I'll go back into the batch, the same place we were at before, and I'm going to go pick week one. Here's my batch that was in the process of filling. I'm going to go in and just edit it. And here is that same list of prescriptions that you saw before, and actually the same one at the top that actually needs refeeds. And that's the difference between a manual batch and a scheduled batch. With a manual batch, you have to resolve all of the red warning messages first, adding repeats or removing the prescriptions from the batch before you're allowed to process the batch. With a scheduled batch, it actually runs automatically and fills every prescription that it can fill, and then it leaves you to come in in the morning and resolve any remaining ones that had any problems with them, or in this case, needs repeats. So just like you saw before, I'm going to have to go in and make an adjustment to this particular prescription. I'm going to have to go and add the repeats to it to resolve that. I'm going to process the batch. You've seen this form before. I'm process it. The system will fill that, in this case, one remaining prescription for me. I can print the labels if I want to at that point if I hadn't already asked for them, and I'll just close off the form. This is now empty because my batch is no longer outstanding, and just close off and I'm back to the main form. So all of this is available to you. And again, you may be using parts of it already. The important thing is, again, now that you can also now set up those different cycles and schedule. And you don't need to have 100 patients in these batches to set this up. You may just have a half a dozen patients that come in for their regular weekly fills. And you can just add those patients to a nursing home and have the system just automatically fill these prescriptions or I'll allow you just to go in and manually go fill them when you want to. So that was my quick little uh, blurb on batch filling for retail patients. And so, Scott, I'm going to throw it back to you now for the next couple of things if you want to start off and explain calendar functions. Great. Thank you very much, Russell. About a year and a half ago, the Kroll team implemented the calendar, very basic, uh, modeled after Outlook calendar. It's accessed through the calendar tile on the right-hand side of your start screen. And if you are using it, you will notice a red or a purple number now, and that represents the number of appointments that are scheduled for that particular day. So the calendar can be used to document your appointments uh, for patient-centric care or patient-centric services that you want to be able to uh, manage a little more effectively. Some stores have actually used this too to document staff-related information such as vacations and schedules. So going back to the screen, clicking the tile will display it. You have in this particular example, we have two separate calendars, one for Pharmacist 1 and one for Pharmacist 2. We can have an unlimited number of calendars if you wish. At the top, you have the option to combine the two calendars into one view by clicking the Combined button. We have provided a day report, which is just a printed report of all the appointments broken down by calendar on a particular day, so Pharmacist 1 or Pharmacist 2 could know exactly who they are going to be meeting throughout the day and what service are going to be provided. The new button will allow you to create a new appointment directly from the calendar. Another option will be to just to double click on a time frame and that will also open up an appointment schedule uh, screen. The day, you have the ability to change the view with using the last one from the day to the week to the month. The question always comes up, how do I set up my calendars? From the start screen, you select Edit Lists, and you're going to be looking at 
two key elements on the right-hand side, the appointment types and calendars. These are the two features in lists that govern how our calendar behaves in this setup. So let's look at appointment types first. <clears throat> you can create your own appointment type if you wish to be more in line with your particular business or pharmacy professional model. Coral provides a standard list which you basically see in front of you. With each appointment type, you can also <clears throat> excuse me, assign a service to it. If that service is supported in Coral, then you can actually launch that service directly from the calendar. You do not have to exit the calendar or go to the patient profile. So for example, if you have set up a medication review for a patient, because we've linked it to the medication review service, which is supported, you just need to select the appointment, and then from the appointment calendar, just select launch service, and you're right into your meds check or your provincial med review forms. So to add a new one, you would just click insert. You can select an icon if you want. You provide a name for the appointment type. You select the service that you want to link to it if you wish. And you want to set the default time or a time frame for how long the appointment should last. The default is actually defined in store config, but in this case, in this particular situation, you can override that and by just putting in how long you want this one to uh, last. Click Save when you're done. Now the second one is Calendars, and this is where you actually define the number of calendars and the title for each calendar that you want to support. In our example, we have two. We have one for Pharmacist 1 and one for Pharmacist 2. So to add a calendar, very simply you click Insert. <clears throat> the Edit Calendar screen will display. Make sure it's active. Key enter in a name, the pharmacist name, pharmacist one, or whatever you'd like, and then you define a color. <clears throat> this will be the color of the calendar so you can easily differentiate one from the other. Once again, once these are set up, click Save. Okay. <clears throat> the calendar functionality, there is a bit of a user guide if you wish on the Kroll website if you would like to take a look at it in a little more detail. The next topic we're going to kind of talk about is how we can optimize our inventory reconciliation processes by using Kroll. <clears throat> Sorry guys. So inventory reconciliation is pretty basic. We just want to make sure that our on-hand quantities in Kroll equal the physical on-hand quantities that we have on our shelf. This concept is very prevalent in the front shop of most pharmacies and retail stores and is coming into its own in, curl, in uh, pharmacy as well. So signs that we may have a bit of a, a challenge or something we want to look into might include, not necessarily limited to this list, items that are coming up on a suggested order continually or very frequently. The user sees the insufficient inventory prompt a little more frequently than normal, but yet when they turn their head and look at the shelf, they've got a full bottle there. Your balance owings all of a sudden start increasing. Now some possible causes, once again, not necessarily limited to this list. We're not receiving our invoices properly through curl. We're selecting the wrong pack size when we're setting up our prescriptions. I stock a 500, but for some reason I select the 100 pack size to process my prescription. We're not returning items to stock properly. We're not canceling and we're not actually putting the product back on the shelf. Supplier mispicks are not managed correctly. Now this is a little more difficult because a supplier mispick means the human at the wholesaler side has actually picked the wrong product, so there's no record of it on your PO and there's no record of it on your invoice. And chances are that if they put the wrong product in, they haven't given you the right product. And unfortunately, theft is also a possible cause for this out of balance. The Coral application provides two approaches, once again, to what we call cycle count. And cycle count is a tool or is a process by which we compare and update our physical on hands and our crawl based on hands as well. We have a basic one where you basically are going to compare the system on hand to the physical on hand on a per drug record basis and adjust accordingly. We also have an advanced cycle count process that actually utilizes some specific functionality. So let's take a look at the basics first. Actually, let me take a step back, I apologize. <clears throat> Doesn't 
independent of which approach is taken, certain permissions for your users must be set up in order for this to work. So from file configuration permissions, you're going to select the appropriate user group, and the highlighted options in green need to be checked. So those are allow drug mixture changes, allow drug inventory changes, and apply drug inventory counts. Without these options selected, users who are linked to that group will not be able to conduct a cycle count, whether advanced or even basic. <clears throat> In addition, if we go into file configuration, store, and security, we can force the logging of on-hand changes by ensuring that the options checked in the green box are actually checked. So logging on hand changes, make sure that the user has to enter in a reason why they're making a non-hand change. And if we select require user login, then the user actually has to log in. So then you know emphatically who actually made that on hand change. <clears throat> if you wish, you can even set this up for specific drug schedules just by placing the schedule that you want uh, focused in on in the field that's currently blank on our option on our screen right now. And with the logging activated, any and all changes are included on our inventory history report. So what do we do in a basic approach? On a per record basis, you just compare the system on hand to the physical on hand for each item, physically count what you have, compare the two, and then adjust accordingly. And these adjustments that I just mentioned will be reflected on your inventory history report. So as a pharmacy manager or owner, you can periodically spot check who's actually doing some physical on-hand changes and the reasons why those changes are occurring. The advanced, a little more complex, but offers some key advantages. It's user initiated and you can define what needs to be actually cycle counted within your pharmacy. You have a couple of options, either all drugs or a specific section of the dispensary. This functionality provides documentation that forms a very tight audit trail. To initiate a cycle count using this functionality, you go from the start screen, select utilities, drug, drug inventory counts. The first screen that you see will be the one on your left, which will list any outstanding cycle counts that still need to be completed. And it provides you with the ability to create a new one. So if we select Create New, the pop-up on the right will display. You select either to pre-select drugs that you want to count, or if you just want to start going, you just click Scan and Go and start counting now. For our purposes, we've selected Pre-select so that you can see that you get a secondary screen where you can fine tune exactly which products you want to be cycle counted specifically at this time. Functionality that this provides includes the ability to scan the UPCs to confirm both the product and the pack. You still key enter the physical on hand quantity per pack. You generate the reports to evaluate your inventory changes before you actually adjust the inventory. So you have an opportunity to evaluate the physical count and make a decision as to whether or not you want to recount or actually accept that new count into your system. This does give you the ability to adjust the inventory for multiple products all at once. This is not a per record approach like your basic. This is on mass. So anything that you have counted within the cycle count will be updated based on what you want. And the reports document who performed those actions and again, providing that necessary audit trail for a manager or the owner to determine who's doing what. And once again, the changes made via this calculate or this functionality are also reflected on the inventory history report. So once again, you can see exactly what's going on. So okay, my turn for the next sections. Thank you, Scott. So I'm going to take a few minutes here and talk to you about an optional feature in the Kroll product called Fax RX Cloud. And essentially what that does is it replaces your physical fax machine, yet still allows you to uh, send outbound faxes and receive inbound faxes as well. 
So I'm going to show you how you would send a fax right from a typical cruel report. I'll talk about the receiving and processing of those inbound faxes. And then without a fax machine, well, I have a piece of paper. How do I actually still fax that out to a client if I need to? So on your main start screen here, uh, once this feature is activated, I'm just going to go into the patient record, and you've probably done this a hundred times. We're just going to go pull up the patient, tag a couple of scripts on the profile, and I'm going to choose fax doctor from the extra function menu. And it comes up my fax doctor form, and as usual, I've got my printer in my tray, and then if everything's good, I can just click on the print button, and away it prints. So, but of course, in that case, I now have a piece of paper that I now have to walk over to my fax machine. I have to key in manually the fax number, put the paper in the fax machine, and then hit the send button at that point. And when I'm done, I probably need to shred the piece of paper because I don't need it anymore. Well, with this fax RX cloud module enabled, any report that is typically also faxed out, we've added a second option now to the printer option where it just says fax. So you can actually select the fax option optionally ask for a confirmation page and the print button changes into a fax button. So once I'm ready to go, I'll just actually hit enter or click on the fax button and that will actually be placed in a queue for me right now and then I just close off the form like I normally would. Now back at the start screen, here are my, in this example, here are my two prescriptions in my doctor callback, and you'll see under the comment now, it's automatically being tagged with the fact that these are being faxed at and shows the timestamp that they've actually put into the fax. And over here, I have an outbound fax tile. Clicking on that will show me the queues of all the items that's currently in that queue and ready to be sent out. So here's my report that I just did a fax on, and you'll see here's the phone, the fax number it's actually going to be sent to, and it's taken that right off of the fax number from my doctor card in this case and dropped it in automatically so I'm not actually having to key in the fax number at all. Now, about every 30 seconds or so, that queue is checked to see if there's any outstanding items in there. If it finds something, it automatically grabs it and actually sends it to the cloud and, in fact, clears my queue out altogether. Now, in this case, let me show you how an inbound document works. So under inbound documents, I've got a tile here, an indication that I've got two prescriptions or two, sorry, two images waiting in my inbound queue. So I'm going to go click on that tile. And what we'll see here is we're going to see a list of all of the inbound documents that are currently outstanding that I need to do something with. On the right-hand side, I've got a preview screen of the current document, the current facts that I have highlighted, so I can take a quick glance as to what's on there. Now, in this particular case, is a perfect example where I get lots of junk faxes. Well, if I had a fax machine, I've got all this junk paper, so I'm having to shred this or throw out my junk faxes. But by having it come right into the curl system, if this is junk fax, all I actually need to do is, with that item highlighted, just simply select the delete button, confirm delete of the document, and away it's gone out of my system. Now, in this case, I'm now left with my one inbound doc. This is the one that I faxed out earlier. The doctor has now signed it and faxed it back to me. So I'm going to select that item, and in this case, I'm going to hit F to call up the document on the screen. Now, with any document, I can decide what I want to do with this now, is I can just simply delete it from here. I can send this to my internal mail system. I can save it against a patient record. I can forward along or fax it back out to someone else. Or in this example, I'm going to use it to process prescriptions with. This is an incoming script order, essentially. Now, in this case, with a lot of our reports today, we're now printing these 2D barcode on the bottom of the reports for any report that we may typically end up scanning back into our system. Now, embedded in that 2D barcode is all the information that our system needs to know as to what to do with this particular document that just came inbound. In this example, it knows it was a prescription authorization request that we generated earlier. It knows the time and stamp, and it knows the patient it was actually generated for. So this is going to 
process as, as automatically or smoothly as I possibly can. So I'm just going to tick the process button in the bottom corner, and it brings me, if you're familiar with our RX drop-off form, showing me that it's going to start with a copying my old RX from one of those I selected to a new RX. It knows there's two on this document, so this is going to be the first one of two that showed on the document. It's automatically brought the prescription information in from my original prescription that I sent out from the authorization. So if necessary, I can make some minor edits if the doc has made any changes to that. And then I can either OK this or indicate that the doctor refused it. So I'm going to click on the OK. It's going to put this one into my work order. It's now showing me the second prescription on this document. Again, I can make some changes if I need to or some adjustments and then indicate whether it was OK to refuse. So we'll OK that one as well. At the bottom of the screen, I can either now put this in my to-do queue and fill it later when I have time, or I can select the Fill Now button, which is what I'll use on this case. So I hit fill now, my preview screen comes up. If you have this one turned on already, you'll be familiar where I have my script image on the left hand side. I can make any other fine last second adjustments at this point, and then I would process my prescription like I normally would. And I would repeat that for every script on that document. In this case, I go back to the start screen. My inbound document queue has now been cleared, and my outbound or my callbacks has now also been cleared for those two prescriptions that I had in there. So what if I have a piece of paper that I need to fax out, and I don't have a fax machine anymore? What you do is you go to the outbound fax tile, and in this upper right corner here, we've got this new fax button. So I'll just simply select the new fax, and I'm going to start typing in, who do I want to send this fax to? Well, by typing, start typing in the first few characters, it will automatically go through your database, and it will locate any physician, any patient, any store that has a matching characters to what you typed in and show you the fax number associated with that entry. So from that list, I can then very quickly select the, the entity I'm going to be sending this to, and now I need to attach my document. Well, I can actually attach it from scanning it in, so I can actually now scan this into my document scanner. I can actually grab an existing inbound document from my fax or network scan inbound doc file, or I can even select a file that's on my computer right now. So I'm just going to do that one. I'm actually going to just simply attach a, a document that I already had prepared on my computer. And in the lower corner here, I'm going to go click the send button. That, just like we saw before, puts it in my outbound fax queue. And again, every 30 seconds, the queue is checked. And once it finds something in there, it sends it up to the cloud and empties my queue. So that's basically all the rundown I want to do on the FaxRx cloud. There will be additional information at the end of the seminar where if you would like more information, you can certainly request more information on that module. What I want to do right now is on this very last section, I call this my tips and tricks, or as I sometimes like to refer to it as my speed round. I'm going to try to cover off as many things as I possibly can in five minutes. So I'm going to start off here with my first, very first item. It's just patient alternate last name. So on the patient card, we've actually got this alternate last name field. So if you have a patient whose last name is going to change, they've just gotten married and they're going to now switch to their married name, you can go bring up your patient record and under the alternate last name field, first of all, type in their old or their, their legacy name and then under the last name field, put in their new last name and then actually save that record. So later on, that patient shows up again, and I may be a different user, different pharmacist. I don't know that they've changed their last name. So I'm going to search for them the same way I would before, using their old last name and part of their regular first name on here. And sure enough, the system will still locate that patient because it's used that alternate last name field and combined it with the regular last name field to try to find a match for you when it does its initial search. So in this case, I've got Jessica, formerly Beale, now Timberlake, and it, it located Jessica even though I used her old last name because I recorded it in the alternate last name field. Recent menu. Under both the patient, 
the drug, the doctor, and the prescription screen, we've added a recent menu. So under any one of those cards, when you're in that field, you can just simply pull down the recent menu, and it will give you a list of the last 20 records that you access, who they were, what they were, and the time that you last accessed them. So if you know you were just looking at Jessica about 30 minutes ago on this terminal, you can actually just bring up the recent menu, and you'll find Jessica in the list of recent hits. Just simply click on her name, and instantly you're now back on her file without even having to type any part of her name or anything. And again, that's under both patient, drug, and doctors, and the fill screen itself. Patient alternate addresses. You already know today that when you create a doctor card on our system, you can indicate under the doctor or prescriber multiple addresses, different clinics or hospitals that you may be working at. Well, you can actually do similar for the patient record as well. Under the patient record, under the far right-hand side view menu, we've got this alternate address button, or from the view menu, alternate addresses here. Clicking on either one of those will bring this grid on up on the lower half of the patient card where it will show the different various alternate addresses. Simply to add a new one, click on the insert button, type in a friendly name for that alternate address, key in all of the demographics, and optionally at the bottom, you can indicate whether this secondary address is going to be used as the default address for any time you create a delivery order on Kroll and or if you want to use this address as the billing information for the accounts receivable for statements and or invoices. So just click Save on that and it will add that to the lower half of the screen. And alternately, you can add additional. There's no limit to how many alternate addresses that you want to add. Now, later on, when you're bringing up that patient record, we now provide a hint that there are additional addresses. You'll see that there's this little new button that's being added here on the right side of the address two line, or under the view menu, you've also got a number in brackets as to how many additional addresses there are. And of course, you can click on either one of those, and that will bring up the grid on the lower half of the screen so you can view, edit, or add new ones if necessary. Patient profile filter. So the first one I'm gonna show you on here, you probably already know how to do this. I'm gonna to go to a patient record, patient profile. I'm gonna select a particular drug on the, a particular prescription on the patient file from extra functions, display therapeutic equivalents, or I could have just hit control F5, and it will then automatically provide me a filter in this example for the same therapeutic classification of the RX I had selected before I did the control F5. Now, what we've also added today is a filter profile RX option, again, from the ribbon bar or, in this case, from the profile menu. So I can click on either of those options if I want to. And what that'll do is that opens up a new filter field on here. Now, in this field here shown, I can type any part of a brand, a generic name, or a DIN number, and then I can actually click on the filter button and any matches in my profile for that drug, brand, generic, or DIN will now show in the list. Now, if I want to, I can simply clear this filter. And another option I've got here is I can actually filter by Rx comment as well. So I can select Rx comment. I can type in any part of a comment that I remember I added for this patient under one of their prescriptions. And then I can click on the filter button. It will display any prescription where a comment has been added with that information that I typed in to do a search on. So I can now select that prescription, hit the modify button, and sure enough, there in the lower corner shows that information that I was actually typing earlier. Post-dating the ordering of a drug. You might have a very expensive drug, you might have only one patient on it, and you really don't wanna to have to carry that on your shelf for any longer than necessary. So what I'm gonna show you here is how you can actually have the system essentially order this just in time for that patient that uh, keeps coming in monthly or every three months. So first of all, pull up the drug that you've got, go to the ordering tab, and over here, what you'll want to do is disable the automatic ordering feature. We don't want this to go on order as soon as you dispense it, for example, as soon as it goes down to zero, we're now gonna actually manually place this on order. So disable the automatic ordering, click on the place order button like you would for any manual order and indicate the order quantity. But instead of just hitting the enter key at this point, use the tab key. 
go down one field to the order date, it always defaults to the current date. But what you can actually do here is change that date and post date it. So I'm going to change this from October of 2018. I'm going to change it to January of 2019 in this example. And now I'll click on the Save button. You'll see down in the lower corner, it shows me this outstanding order. But you'll see the order date is not until January 12th of next year. So as time goes on and my automatic orders or my manual orders that I'm placing every night take place, this drug's not going to show up on that order until I get to the evening of January 12th and automatically this drug will now appear on the order. So the idea is I'll set that post date to just a few days before I expect the patient to arrive. The drug will go on order just a couple of days beforehand and it'll arrive in my dispensary just before the patient does. So that's my quick little speed round on there. Now, what we're going to do here is uh, hopefully we've answered uh, several of your questions that you might have had, but we're going to be able to open up the lines now and actually allow you to ask any questions that you may have for us. Uh, Cheryl, do we have any inbound calls now queuing up? Yes, so we have uh, Aaron Walker who's queued up. Please go ahead, Aaron. Hello, I just have a question regarding the print and scan paperless feature. I'm just wondering how you deal with um, prescriptions that may have multiple copies of the original. Perhaps you had an original prescription and then a second page where you maybe received a fax clarification from the doctor. Do you have to print off additional auxiliary scannable labels for each page? The barcode that you generate on your laser label set is specific for that cell. So when it's scanned, it's used. So if you do need to feel you have to scan in another uh, document, bring up the prescription in modify mode, and then you have okay. the option on the right-hand side to scan more images in, and they will be linked to that specific RX. Okay. So uh, what if you did do a second auxiliary label and you had multiple multiple image or multiple prescriptions with the same auxiliary label on it? Would that not work? No. The system would just recognize the first one that it comes across, and okay. it probably would reject the second. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Cheryl? Yes, we have another question in the queue. Uh, our question is this time from Paul Gallant. Please go ahead, Paul. Hello, how are you? Not too bad. Yeah. My question is, I was following all what you were doing with the cloud facts, which basically we have that. Where I'm lost is at that last point where you put all the information in for your script, where do I pick it up from them to actually finish it, to print, print it out? So sorry, uh, this is an inbound document. Where do you go from from getting it from the inbound document queue to filling a prescription? Yeah, so I, I followed everything that you did in your demonstration, and I often get to that point, but then it seems to get lost in, 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 in there, and I don't know what to do next. To gotcha. So, gotcha. Now, uh, with uh, two different ways, like uh, when you're in that outbound uh, option uh, and you, you tag the particular inbound uh, uh, document that showed up, you'll hit the F to fill to bring it up to that first screen. Now, if it's a document that we've printed and has the 2D barcode on, the system should automatically know what to start doing with it once you hit the process button, but you might have just simply an inbound a brand new script with no barcoding on at all. In that particular case, it will simply bring you up to that same screen, but you will have to drop down that list and pick the option that actually says use it to process a prescription. Now, unlike what I showed you, because I had a 2D barcode on it, so it basically walked me through, in that case, when you use that and there's no 2D barcode on it, it will then take you to, I believe, our drop-off screen. Of course, there won't be any patient, drug, or any information showing at that point, but it should then allow you to then start entering that information in, um, in the preview screen and then use that to complete the RX. It should take that image at that point and have it attached automatically to the prescription. And a follow-up question to that. When you uh, say that you have a hard copy prescription and you're scanning it in, is there a way that you can have it that it both like sends a fax to the doctor and puts it on the hard copy in one step, or do you have to do the two separate steps? Scott, can you answer that one? 
I don't quite understand the question. I'm sorry. You... Okay, so uh, I have a, uh, a prescription for, for instance, what I'm, we're doing a lot is it's continued care prescriptions. So you're, I'm writing out a, a form, and I'm scanning that in to fax the doctor to let the doctor know that I've done the prescription. But I also need to put a copy of that onto the hard copy as well to say that that's my prescription for that new prescription that I've created. Is there a way that I can do that in one step, or do I still have to do fax the doctor and then do a second step where I put that barcode and scan it on to the, uh, the hard copy? I believe it's the latter. Unfortunately, you'd still have to do it in two steps. Okay. That was my question. So, but You know what, though? You bring up an interesting point um, in that specific scenario and that maybe we do need to take a look at a one-step solution to allow – you know, the faxing, but then at the same time, you know, import. Yeah, as, like I was trying a, to do as two. A, as a written prescription. It may be similar, kind of similar to what we've done with and what we showed you with the fax doctor report. Um, but yeah, we'll keep that in the back of our mind. So I really appreciate that. Okay, no problem. I'll let you go now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, so anyways, just I'd like to just sort of summarize. Uh, first of all, uh, we really do appreciate uh, everybody. Both, as I say, the the it was rather an overwhelming response. Uh, we realized that uh, you know it's been the first time we've done this in something like thirty plus years, so it's not surprising at all. Uh, as I said at the end of this uh, webinar, uh, when you do close off, you will be presented with a very quick survey. So we would really appreciate appreciate any feedback, any constructive criticism, because from that information, that'll help us to determine what the next type of webinar might actually look like going into the following years. Uh, if we haven't already answered all your questions, we certainly recommend uh, to contact us through our regular channels, either through our uh, email address or through the phone number. Um, and also to let you know that in a few days, you'll also receive an email that actually has a link to this session so that you can watch it again or share it with someone else if you want. And on a side note here, if any of you are actually going to be in the uh, participating in Pharmacy U this Saturday in Vancouver, please come on by our booth. Uh, both Scott and myself, as well as a couple others, will be there. We'll also be attending some of the sessions. So we'll certainly look forward and can try to answer any other remaining questions you may have at that time. Other than that, we really, again, appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to watch this presentation. As I said, we know that some of you will know a lot of things on here. We hope that everyone has at least been able to go home tonight with a couple of things under their belt that maybe they weren't familiar with the Kroll system. So thank you very much again, and everybody, have a good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Improve Your Kroll Knowledge webinar. Thank you very much for your participation and have a nice evening.